Hello there. Welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. Across Australia, Officeworks has 167 locations with 40,000 different products in their catalogue. And their mission is, in their own words, helping people make bigger things happen every day, whether that's at home, at school or at work. Now, for most Australians, they think of Officeworks as the place you go to get things printed out or to buy supplies for your office or for while you're studying. But the world is changing, as we all know, and the power of data is a really big leader in that, which is one of the reasons why I was really, really excited to sit down and have a chat to this week's guest, Selena Lee. She's actually the tech lead at Officeworks, and she came from a finance background, got kind of excited about the world of data and studied and ended up where she is now. But as she points out, her job isn't cut and dry. There's a lot of crossover between things like a data architect or a data analyst or pretty much any job within the data sphere. So join me as I sit down and have a catch up with Selena. We learn a little bit more about her journey and her advice for people who want to get involved in the data field, which is, yeah, a really exciting thing to sit down and hear her talk about. Let's do it then. Uh, Selena Lee, uh, thank you very much for joining me. You are the tech uh, make sure I get this one right, Tech Lead for Data Products at Officeworks out of Australia. Um, Officeworks is a pretty big company there, isn't it? Like, like it's a bit of a staple now, no pun intended, um, to the way that Australians do things and, and like set up offices, set up educational spaces, things like that. Um, for me, as somebody who, who yeah, I sort of built my own office in, in that here, I'm kind of curious um, what a typical day actually looks like for you yeah so you mean the typical day uh in office works or like as, yeah. uh, as a data engineer or both well, well, of both really <laughs> like i i, I realized that there's things that you certainly wouldn't be able to talk about totally get that um but i'm kind of curious how um data engineering kind of falls into something that office works does like how the two overlap yeah okay so um so I think maybe I'll just talk about the like what's a typical day like for a data engineer yeah. like yeah because actually to to me like there's no very typical day because every day will basically be very different it mm -hmm. um, well depending on like for example which kind of project you're currently on and what the stage of that particular project is at at the current moment so basically data engineering is nothing but like it's basically an art of how to um, bring the data to your internal and external customers or users, making the data available to them in a timely manner, making sure the data is in a good quality and of course in a secured way because people are concerned about the um, mm -hmm. like data breaches and data leakages these days. Um, so what and we wanted to protect personal information as well. So it's all about making sure the data available in, in time, accurate, complete, um, and also of course secure as well. Um, so the daily job will really depend on, for example, sometimes you will be building um, some da new data pipelines to onboard some new data sets from a new source system. Sometimes you will be basically supporting some business initiatives, making sure you pipe the data in the way that the data becomes available to the end user. And then sometimes you'll be working on, for example, enhancing the data governance, for example, data quality, lineage, um, and uh, availability and so on. And sometimes you'll be basically working on some, like fixing some existing pipes. Um, but overall speaking, um, if I look at the whole, um, the whole, the work content of the data engineer, I'll, uh, for my current job, I'll perhaps divide that into several, uh, several part maybe like 50 or 60 percent of the job is about supporting like business initiatives um, so for example for officeworks um, you know like we joined the flybys program in the december of 2021 and currently we're also joining like the one pass program which is uh, the uh, like a membership program provided by west farmer group um, so what we did, for example, is to basically pipe the data in the way, for example, uh, to make sure it satisfies the business requirement. For example, now as a OnePass member, you can enjoy like five times of flybys points when you do transactions with Officeworks. Um, so what we did is basically pipe the data in the way like you can get that, that five, five times bonus points. 
Um, so this is one example that, for example, the business initiatives. So maybe like 50 to 60% of my time is on that. And uh, another like 20% is maybe on how to opt, opt lift um, the current data platform. Um, because we're currently ha having um, running our data platforms in like uh, using the, some of the modern stack technologies uh, such as AWS, Snowflake, and so on. We wanted to make sure our platform is up to date and um, we, we can up and lift, um, uplift the data, uh, data platform capabilities. Um, and also sometimes we'll look at how to improve the data management part by onboarding some new tools or framework um, for example, for data quality and so on. So that will be another 20%. Um, and uh, I think about 10, another 10% 10 will be basically do some support and troubleshooting. For example, as mentioned, maybe sometimes the, the existing pipe just got broken and you need, um, you need to fix the pipes and making sure uh, those bars can be removed at the first, first, first time and making sure we are satisfying all those, uh, all those data service level agreement, SLAs, uh, making sure um, the user is happy. And um, for the left of the, the 20%, maybe 10% is more on meetings um, because 10% might be sounds um, like small compared to what I daily spend, uh, daily, daily spend time on the meetings. But uh, basically you have, because we you run things in agile, you're gonna have the ceremonies, cadences and the meetings like stand-ups and spring planning and the uh, like retrospective sessions and so on. So that will be about 10% of, of the work content. And maybe the final 10% is all and like continuous learning and development. You will be looking at learning new stuff because every every time like maybe a new project or new tool, everything's different. So it's just a, more, more about uh, learning and development. Yeah. That sounds like a really full on schedule, right? Like there's so much diversity in there as to what you're doing and, and, and how it all sort of feeds back into each other. And I'm really jealous about the flybys thing, uh, here in New Zealand flybys is announced that they're shutting down. So. Oh, really? Okay. Any. Yeah. Um, end of this year, they've decided to, to leave the New Zealand market. So I'm not going to okay. get any extra points for buying anything anywhere. It's terrible. It's just it's not <laughs> worth it. Not at all. Yeah. Maybe um, you can try the overseas. Uh, yeah, purchase. And I don't shipping. know. I don't think Australian flybys work in New Zealand. I'm pretty sure they don't. I didn't check last time I was there, but I, I can okay. try next time, see what happens. Um, yeah. With that, that very diverse list that you've got, I'm kind of curious then how they've sort of evolved over your career. Sort of what's different now compared to say five, six, seven years ago? Yeah, definitely that uh, changed quite a lot. So as a, I think um, when I started as a data engineer, like maybe six years, six to seven years ago, my job was more like uh, my uh, my daily life was more like individual contributor. So I remember I was working for a company. Uh, it's a it's a great local consulting firm named Servian, um, and I was working for one of the major banks to help them to do a uh, like um, data uh, digital transformation project uh, with data. So basically my, um, you know, like we have a spring, uh, we have a spring every two to three weeks. So what am I, um, I'm doing, I was doing daily was basically pick up a ticket from the springboard, um, making sure, um, and, uh, the, the tickets can move fast and in a good quality. And we also have stand up. We had also had stand ups where we reflected on our progress and maybe ask them some questions or ask for some support and so on. So that'll be a very typical um, life for as an individual contributor. Um, and uh, after working um, that in that company for one year, I joined another consulting firm named Deloitte as a senior consultant. Uh, so the life changed quite a lot because I started to pick up experience to start owning, designing and building an end-to-end -end data solution. So for example, you were basically given a scope of works, you went it to the clients and you work on the scope of works. Uh, for example, beginning from some workshops or di discovery workshops and moving to designing so the solution, implementing and building the solution and finally testing and deploying that and doing some knowledge transfer 
back uh, in to the client as well. So that's that is when I started to own uh, the data solution from end to end. That is and that makes you to open to have a bigger picture of how things work. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, back to that, at that time. And uh, I think three years ago, I joined Officeworks uh, as an in-house data role. I was play, playing the role of a late data engineer in there. So the, the life started uh, started in office work pretty much like whatever uh, what, be, what I was doing before in Deloitte. Basically, you're also owning a data solution from end to end. Um, but the perspective um, changed quite a lot because previously you were working as a consultant, you built something and you went away. Um, they mm -hmm. moved to something else, maybe building something other, uh, for the other clients. Um, but now as an in-house data engineer, your role changed. You will basically staying right here, supporting whatever you build. And also you might also spend some time uh, looking at how to iterate that over time, how to better support your uh, internal customers and so on. So it was when I basically started learning how to um, design and build things in a more maintainable or sustainable way. Um, so because you will be right here, continue supporting that. Um, so very, very, very simple example is like when you write a code, the most critical thing is not just to make it fancy, make it work, but also you need to put quite a lot of like um, detailed comments and making sure things are playing and the simple enough for the next person to come to understand. So that will be um, the the in-house role. And and now I think it, it evolved further, like because as you step into a more like data product owner or a tech, uh, as mentioned, tech lead role. So the, I think the focus now shifted from like uh, most uh, from like how, how to, uh, shifted that from like what and why. So when I talk about what I want, why it's basically, you, you still have a scope of works for those projects. Mm -hmm. You're still given like what to do, but for most of the times it will be an open-ended question. You don't, the things are not like fixed for you. You just, the, the, uh, the internal customers or business stakeholders came to you saying, like, oh, I've got this question of this, I've got this problem to resolve and you to tell what's the best way to uh, help, uh, what's the best way to help them to resolve it. So basically you are owning this data pro product, you are uh, shaping that up step-by-step, step. you're owning the backlogs, you're developing the roadmaps, and also you are the person talking to the stakeholders and making sure um, they are meeting their requirements. And basically you look at what and why um, in a bigger picture. And that how to part stays there as well. Like, but it's also getting bigger because previously you just look at um, given the tool, given the scope works, how to get it work. And but now like it becomes a, a it becomes an open ended question again. Um, for example, you are to tell how to select the right tool for the right scenario, and you are to uh, look at the bigger picture, looking at uh, the business goal of the company and trying to resolve a $200, uh, $200 issue in, compared with a $5 issue. And you're trying to look at those um, integrations with the source systems and the target systems, making sure uh, all, all the different group, working groups are happy, all the different departments and teams are happy um, doing a win-win win -win situation. So those kind of thing um, get, gets bigger. It sounds like you're a bit of a nexus point for everything that's going on within the data field within that organization. Um, a lot of pressure? Quite a lot of them. Every day it's like, um, I think very obvious and now it's getting more and more meetings compared mm -hmm. to the previous uh, life as individual contributor. Nowadays it's more like getting meetings, uh, full day blog to back to back meetings. Uh, quite busy, but so sometimes uh, you need to get, you still need to write code, but you get to write code in early morning or late evening. Um, but it's quite, uh, it's quite challenging, but it's pretty rewarding because you can see, you can make a bigger impact and you can see what you are driving can come to a, a, a very feasible solution, making the customer happy. Yeah. Um, Clearly, you are very passionate about this, which is fantastic to see in the field. I'm kind of curious how that passion was unlocked for you. Like, like, was there a spark moment that you went, this is something I really want to do? 
or was it sort of I'm going to study in this because I know there's money in it and then sort of getting engaged in it. I, I'm kind of curious as to what, what drives you really. Yeah, I think that um, I actually uh, share sharing a bit of my background. I actually, uh, I come from China and I spent my university in Hong Kong. So after mm -hmm. graduating from the, the university, I started working in finance industry for actually three, four, three to four years. I basically worked as a, a financial analyst for one of the private equity firms based in Hong Kong. So what I, my daily job was basically um, to support the mergers and the acquisition deals and like, for example, pre-IPO investment and so on. Uh, I was basically like doing meetings with client and performing due diligence or uh, financial modeling. I still remember those days I was working toward, working with financial models like how to calculate the value of a company by discounting the future cash flows and how to look at by all by looking at the PE or PB comparison with your peers and so on. So those are the very interesting experience. Um, and I, I remember like out of the deals um, I was handling, there were two use cases which I found particularly interesting. So one of them, one of them it was like um, we helped uh, a client reached out to us, um, and that client was basically a postdoc uh, PhD from a very famous university in Hong Kong. And he, he was daily studying and researching on how to, uh, about computer visions. And he was exploring how to launch those computer vision research works into commercialization. And that was one use case. And then in a, another use case is we're basically helping um, a pretty like leading AI and uh, leading AI and cloud solution company based in Shenzhen to try to do um, something with their investment and with their investors and so on. So those uh, those two use cases are pretty interesting because I found I started to feel and witness how the technology is it was reshaping and uh, was to reshape the world. So I just got very personally interested in those those um, new tech field, and I wanted to learn more about it. So that's what motivated me to pursue a degree, um, IT degree with the Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah, and and the passion to data was actually spark sparkling uh, sparkling when I was doing a internship back to my gra uh, graduation study. I will, um, during my master period, I was doing an internship with a Adelaide-based company, and that company was reselling data products or and IT solutions on behalf of the providers such as uh, like MapR, Apache Spark, Zoom Data, and Grafana and Power BI. So I was basically playing a role, try to create some. Um, useful and fancy demos, basically to help the company to marketing uh, um, their products. And I remember like there was one demo that I built, which is to utilize um, uh, technology and tools such as Twilio, Zoom Data, MemCircle, and Kafka to build a real-time data pipeline. So basically you were um, playing with your uh, SMS uh, in your phone. You just, uh, for example, imagine you are a farmer uh, in maybe Brisbane, and uh, you're growing your, for example, pineapple or like cherries and so on. So when um, every day, maybe you can just, uh, for example, when you hop in the harvest season, you just type in as an SMS, like today, how many um, kilos of the strawberries I have harvested, and you type in your SMS and click send. And right then you will, uh, we have a centralized dashboard showing that visualizations, showing like, uh, it's a real time because every time when you type and send in your SMS, that particular visualization dashboard will refresh and change to show the latest, uh, like how, 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 how many kilos you have has harvested from your farms and so on. So that looks pretty fancy. So I remember the moment that I got it work, it was super satisfying. I was getting like, oh, this is something I wanted to do <laughs> again. Okay. So that, that sparks the, the passion to data. Yeah. That's fantastic. It does sound a little bit like Farmville. Yeah, a little the, bit. The like, old, that. like the Facebook game that they that used to have, but in real life and, and using, you know, 
real world data that that actually sounds really cool do they still use that pipeline that you built that that that, that, um, that application that you created it was not actually a real pipeline it was like a demo to just okay. showcase to the uh, client clients and protection clients like how these different tools can be uh, adding value to the businesses yeah but i, I hope they are still using it <laughs> I notice a lot of people, um, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, actually, did, uh, went to Carnegie Mellon for for their study. Um, what was it that drew you there? Yeah, I think when I was um, maybe because when I was considering uh, to doing something in the tax space, I was thinking something which will be mandatory, requiring you to do code. Because mm -hmm. I do find uh, I did a bit of research work, um, like different. Uh, there are quite a lot of universities which uh, they provided um, data intelligence, machine learning related courses, um, but but not all of them will be requiring you to be hands dirty to doing those coding stuff. Mm -hmm. And Carnegie Mellon, I, I think, was very known for like uh, driving you to that space and making you really get your hands dirty and. Uh, learn how to coding. I remember very clearly there was a prerequisite of my um, admission to that university was you need to complete it, maybe a eight week Java course before you mm -hmm. got on board into the university. That's a conditional offer. So that, that's oh, when wow. you were pushed down the way to really learn how to code. Because I was observing someone else to like write some Python scripts and do some fancy works, and I was thinking, oh, that's cool. That's that's, that's something I wanted to um, uh, drive myself to. So I, that's why I, I chose Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Okay. Um, fr from your time there to now, um, what kind of trends have you been seeing in the field of data engineering? For you, uh, the trend, I think. Uh, it's it's actually a cycle. So sometimes you'll be seeing the trend of like offshore and uh, decentralization and data mesh, of, for example. And sometimes after a bit of cycle, you come back to like centralization and onshore. So it it's it's really depends on the for example economy landscape and which particular phase the whole industry is at in particular. Um, that is one thing. And now, of course, we ha we have seen the ri rising of AI, especially generative mm -hmm. AI, and I start observing like that start impacting our ways of working. Um, for example, over in a very recent case, um, you know, previously we have um, like build different tables to uh, for different use cases or campaigns. And those different tables are linked to different dashboards and people and can use those dashboards to generate uh, insights and help them to do decision-making. Decision, decision and we have been driving a long journey to try to make this whole thing um, to be available for customers to self-serve them as much as possible. So a recent thing we have done in, in Officeworks, like a recent experiment is basically utilize generative AI to make it uh, smarter. Um, for mm -hmm. example, instead of you build a dashboard and um, you just ask people to find what the what find the answer from the dashboard, uh, because no matter how hard you are, how 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 much uh, effort you put in designing and improving the dashboard, there always turn out to be questions which cannot be answered perfectly mm -hmm. by the dashboard. So that's why we come up with um, experiment with a Gen AI solution, basically to convert human language into SQL. So it's text to SQL um, whenever people just type in a question and uh, behind the scene, they will, the application will do the work for you to call in the G Ch Ch GPT, uh, to call in the GPT-4 and coming back with uh, SQL query and also the answers and also explanation. So that's a bit of like um, tech spike that we're running. Um, but at a higher level, I think I'll also start observing some trend dri dri uh, driven by AI as well. So one of them is like I start observing like the data roles. Um, for example, we previously we have different data roles like data scientist, data engineer, and data analyst. Those roles start blurring 
blurring means like there is no very strict line between what you should do or shouldn't do. Instead, I think the organizations they are driving for um, the seeking to uh, speed up the process from the raw data to AI or to insights and business decision making. So that's where um, organizations want a, maybe a leaner team, but with the more like maybe comprehensive skill sets. So matter whether it's engineering or it's um, it's data scientists or data analysts, you maybe uh, organizations what they really need is a leaner team with uh, multiple skill sets which can drive that progress for them. For example, previously you have like data engineer and data analyst, but now you have uh, what we have is analytical engineer. Uh, which means an analytical engineer will be having both the skill set as a data engineer and also as some doing some data analysis as well. Um, so that combines into the analytical engineer role. And another example is um, previously you have like those different data roles, but now you have AI engineer. AI engineer is supposed to do like maybe previously um, more comprehensively. Um, but with the, AI, the help of AI, you can achieve more by combining those different st uh, skill sets all together. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like a really fast paced change of the landscape as well for people working in the data field. What kind of advice would you give somebody who is looking at starting in now, like wanting to get into the industry now? Yeah, I think um, maybe the first advice is to just, I, I think as maybe Elon Musk mentioned, like just, like, just do it, it gets your hands dirty, start working on it. Uh, maybe at the very first moment, you the moment you start working on it, you find yourself like not fully across everything. Maybe you only um, have knowledge in, in one particular space, not all, but don't worry about that. That's just to get into it and start getting your hands dirty and trying to, uh, trying to pick up things from doing. I think learning by doing that, that's some, something we, we mentioned, like as a tech technical professional, something that will drive your growth and drive your career as well. Um, and I think this, maybe the second advice will be like, um, I think re related to the Gen AI, I know there are different people are thinking very differently, right? Sometimes you will be feeling like maybe that AI thing is very far from me. And sometimes pe people might be thinking, oh, no, I don't, I feel like I hate it. I, I don't want it to get get uh, get my job in future. Um, but anyway, because the trend, the trend is already there, people can not just unsee it. So maybe the advice will be trying to give it a try and see whether you can particular, uh, maybe possibly do things in a different way maybe using um, these, those tools existing in the market and say whether you can do something that you, maybe you'll find you were doing something that you cannot, cannot achieve before. Yeah. Um, and maybe a final tip or advice might be like just uh, um, because whenever, what, whatever role you're playing, you, you could be a data management role or data engineering role or data analyst role and uh, whatever project you're working on and uh, maybe like uh, as mentioned, what technology you're using. Uh, I think the, at, at, at an end of the day, the ultimate goal is basically to drive business value. So I think focus on the, focusing on the issue, the problem itself, and to try to figure out a good way to resolve it, no matter what technology you're, you're playing with, no matter what role you are playing, um, that will be the ultimate focus. Uh, for the use case and uh, resolving the problem yeah perfect i'm out of questions and it's been like half an hour and this has been absolutely amazing but i think we'll wrap it up here because i know you've got the rest of your day to do selena thank you very much for answering my incredibly probing questions it is very much appreciated have a fantastic yeah. day yeah thanks paul i really enjoyed uh, the the i think it's the first uh, first in interview i've done in this way but oh, i like it so Super easy to get started, not scary at all. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to thank Selena again for joining me in this week's episode. You can track her down on LinkedIn. Super easy to find. She's amazing at what she does and so onto it. And 
I kind of want to see whether or not her little farming app that she built is still going, because it feels kind of like Farmville, but in real life, and I do miss me some Farmville. Hmm. Anyway, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell people about this video or this podcast, let everybody know what's going on out there, and hopefully you all learned something from it. Until next time, may the force be with you, and have a fantastic week.